and welcome to another Educator Innovator Hangout on Air. It's Tuesday, April 1st, and today we're going to be talking about 21st Century Notebooking, also known as Hack the Notebook. This is part two in a series that we've started. It began with the NWP annual conference back in November, and a bunch of the participants who were on the call today were there, and uh, another one has joined us from a DML meeting. And we're going to be talking about the Hack the Notebook experience, right? paper and electronics, putting surface mount components into notebooks. It's an interesting mashup, and for English teachers like many of us, it's a particularly interesting chance to think about what notebooking and reflection means with authentic engagement that's very forward-looking and all about technology in very tactile, applied ways. I'm your host. My name is David Cole. I run a little company called CP2. It stands for Collaboration, Voice, and Vision. And I'm thrilled to have this opportunity at Educator Innovator. So today we have with us, we may have a fourth person joining us. We've got uh, four, three people online, a fourth uh, colleague, Jennifer Dick. Um, so we've got Jennifer Dick from NextMap, Kim DeYard, who's the San, San Diego Writing Project Director, Mia Zamora, who's a professor of English at Keene University and directs the Keene University Writing Project, and Peter Kittle, who runs the Northern California Writing Project out of Chico State, where he's a professor as well. Um, so the guests, you guys will have a chance to introduce yourselves in a minute. I'll run through what we're going to do. We're going to divide it up into three parts. Um, all of us were together at the Digital Media Learning Conference uh, in Boston back at the beginning of March. And we wanted to use this meeting as a chance to reflect on what, that, uh, what we got out of that conference around 21st Century Notebooking. Paul O, oh, who is in the background helping to hold this all together here online, uh, hosted a, a pre-meeting before our presentation on 21st Century Notebooking where we talked with writing project folks about uh, the opportunities of Hack Your Notebook. Chi Chi, our collaborator for MIT Media Lab, was there. Jen and myself were facilitating. Uh, all the people on this call were part of that conversation. Then we rolled into a workshop uh, with Chi and piped in Natalie Freed, another collaborator who we'll talk about uh, via Skype and talked about an interesting project called Hack Your Notebook. So we want to reflect on what that was about in the first third of our conversation. The next third, we're going to talk about actual practice and some tactics and logistics and ideas for working with circuit stickers uh, in the classroom. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter, and Kim in particular have got access to some of the early release circuit stickers that GC has shared with us pre, uh, in advance of our Kickstarter release. So we want to look at what these teachers are thinking about in terms of how they'll use those stickers and how they see it working in their classrooms and in their practice. And then the third part is to talk about this summer and where all of us think uh, this work could go. So with that, I'll let people introduce themselves. Jen, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks for that great introduction, David. Uh, my name is Jennifer Dick. I'm the Inside Out Program Director at NextMap, which is our education program. NextMap stands for New Experimental Music Art and Production. And we've launched this 21st Century Notebooking Initiative as a way of trying to tie together uh, STEM and the arts and literacy together in a uh, very cohesive and deep open platform for learning. And we've been so excited and glad to see, oh, that we now have Lou on our webinar with us, who's one of the teachers we're working with, uh, to explore what paper circuitry and 21st century notebooking could do in the classroom. We, we just got started and we're doing our introductions, so um, we'll give you a moment to get situated and then we'll bring you on next. Hey, Kim, do you want to go next? Well, well Lou kind of gets his, uh, he's sure. kind of gets himself set up. Um, my name's Kim Dulard, and I'm the director of the San Diego Area Writing Project. And I'm also a classroom teacher, and I te teach a multi-age class of first, second, and third graders who are going to get to um, explore circuits and hacking their notebooks um, coming up after spring break. Great. Mia. Hi everyone, um, I'm Mia. Um, I'm the director of the Kane University Writing Project, which is in New Jersey. Um, one of the exciting things that I'm working on these days is launching a makerspace and for our writing project and also for the university. Um, and I'm thinking about interdisciplinary initiatives within the university curriculum as much as I'm thinking about our writing project outreach um, initiatives. Um, I'm happy uh, to have this conversation today and, and talk in particular about implementation. Um, and I have some ideas about paper circuitry and this summer. Great. Hey, Peter, you're up. 
Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm Peter Kittle. I direct the Northern California Writing Project in at uh, California State University, Chico. And uh, like Mia, I am thinking in ways that are uh, related to my writing project site, but also to my university. We are uh, in the midst of uh, having a new arts and science or arts and humanities building that's going to have a multi literacy space that I envision as being um, a digital maker space and maybe a bit of a physical phys physical maker space as well. So I think that the circuit stickers could have a real role there. And I'm thinking about a bunch of different ways that uh, this could sort of you know go in all sorts of directions in Northern California. So very exciting stuff. Nice. I'm trying to un oh, there we go. Can you guys hear me? I think I just unmuted. Yeah. yeah. Lou, nice to see your face, Lou. Welcome. All right, thanks. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Lou Buren, and I teach in Corning, California, and I work with the Northern California Writing Project. And um, I was introduced to circuit stickers at the uh, National Writing Project convention in Boston, and I've been using them in my classroom. I teach a, dig a digital literacy class. And uh, with great success, uh, I've used these uh, circuit stickers and have had a, a lot of fun learning about um, circuitry and, and hardware through these stickers. Thanks, Lou. That, that's a great, yep. that's a nice segue. Lou, before you got on, I was describing the way this would run. We'd talk first about uh, some of our experiences collectively at the Digital Media Learning Conference. Uh, the folks okay. on the call were there. Um, and we're going to use that, we're going to springboard off of that into a conversation about what we call the, the Wi-Fi Connected Notebook. Um, when Jen and I first started talking about this project with many of you and with Paul O oh, and Elise Abinadal, mm -hmm. we talked about the implications for hands-on work and connected work. And what we really wanted to explore was how might we go about doing that. And the applicability and the ease of use and the accessibility of the circuit stickers is really pretty profound. Mm -hmm. And we were looking to figure out how we might make that a connected experience and address connected learning opportunities tied into the practices and the rituals and routines we know from using notebooks. And so we set about thinking how to do that. And this is a setup for Jennifer to walk us through what the notebook is. A bunch of you guys have seen this. Uh, we've got a bunch of pictures up on the Flickr site. We have a Google Plus community if you want to go look at it, if you're looking, if you're, if you're piping in and listening. Um, but we want to talk a little bit about the implications of that project and what it might mean. Uh, and then we'll turn to the impl implementation and the tactics around how we can get these projects started. So Jen, do you want to give us a little walkthrough? Also, I'll say Jennifer just posted a, uh, made a post on the NextMap blog that frames it up really well so people can follow up there as well. But Jen, do you want to give us a walkthrough? Sure. So uh, when we first met up with G, we were really impressed by the number of and the breadth of projects that she had been working on. And one of her friends and colleagues is named Natalie Freed, who is also investigating a lot of paper circuitry. And Natalie's background is as a computer scientist. So her work tends to incorporate not just the artful electronics, but also trying to add some sort of logic and computational aspect to them to better uh, enhance the expressive qualities of the work. And so I'm just going to share my screen now. So everyone sing out if you're not seeing a Flickr shut come up right now. So I'm going to see if I can... Okay, so are we all seeing some pictures now? Mm -hmm. Great, so I'm going to click through this set here. And what we have here is a notebook that Natalie made to investigate tides. So this was a topic that Natalie was very interested in, tide pools. And in order to really learn more and direct her learning, she decided she was going to make a notebook that connected to the internet. But again, it's not as with all the paper circuitry work that we're doing and 21st century notebooking hacks that we're looking at, it's not necessarily about the hack as what the hack lets you do for your own learning process. And so Natalie began here by hand drawing and painting a map of different tide pools in the Bay Area, which is where she's based. And you can see that here. And then she opens with this lovely Walt Whitman poem about the tides and the sea. So already we're seeing the interdisciplinary nature of what notebooks let you do as open platforms for learning. And it's very pretty. And she begins to storyboard what some images in her notebook might look like as she's thinking about the nature of tides and what they do in tide pools. She's brainstormed a number of questions that she has about tide pools that she wants to learn about. 
which as any educator, you'll recognize that as a good starting practice for trying to engage people thinking about what their prior knowledge is. But again, it's not just about answering specific scientific questions. It's also an exploration of the experience of tide pools. So she's testing out a number of different pigments here because she knows she wants to include paintings of the tide pools that she's visiting. And so you can see that she's testing them out just like an artist would to see how these different media work on the surface of the paper she's used to create this book. And here's a close-up picture of questions. You can see some of the detail that went into her storyboarding. But it's, again, not just about the artwork or taking notes in a notebook. It's also about what can we do to push what a notebook is further so that it can better do what we want it to do, which in this case is to help her learn about tide pools. So there's this nifty little chip that you'll see in a second called the Spark Core that allows the user to connect something to the internet. And it's up to you, whatever your project is, whatever you want to incorporate some sort of internet connectivity to, you can embed this chip. And Natalie was teaching herself how to use the Spark Core. And so you can see in her Tidepool notebook, she's made notes about how to make this Bluetooth internet connecting chip work. So she's written down the different error codes, the color codes of the light on her Wi-Fi chip. So that way she doesn't have to drag out the manual or look at her phone or bring it up on a computer. She actually is recording her process for both connecting her notebook to the internet and learning about the tide pools all in one place. And she did a painting of tide pools and she realized it wasn't going to work with the paper circuitry she wanted to do. So she made a second painting that was a bit more abstract. And you can see underneath here, she's included some lights. And these are lights that she's made using G-circuit stickers. These, it's a series of parallel circuits that she's used copper tape and these LEDs. And you can see the pictures here. And what these are meant to represent is the tide line. And I'll get to what that means in a second. But you can see the art of both the painting and the art of the electronics coming together to tell a story about tides. And here you can see, again, her wiring. So you've got not just sticking on stickers, but there's also some soldering happening here. There's some engineering that goes into figuring out how she's going to get all the, the number of lights that she wants and the configuration that she wants. And in the back, here we see the back cover of this book that she's created. And you can see this here is the Spark Core chip. It's very small. This is what the actual internet connection is. And what this allows her to do is, if we go back to the pages with the lights, the different levels of lights here are designed to talk to the to an internet uh, a program a computer application that she's written and lives online, that will ping the tide levels as recorded by a NOAA site, NOAA being a government organization that looks after our our oceans, and it can report back to her how high the tide is based on a specific tide pool that she's chosen. So if the tide is high, all of the, the rows of lights will come on. And if the tide is low, then just one or two. So again, she's written a computer application or is in the process of writing one that lives online, goes into this governmental database to see where the level of the tide is, and then based on whatever the data says, the Bluetooth chip then lights the appropriate number of lines of lights here to show Natalie in her tide book what is the current state of the tides, which is pretty nifty. And this is an early prototype. And looking at some more of the hardware that she has here, so this again is the Bluetooth chip. This here is a rechargeable, rechargeable battery that she got from a cell phone recharging case. Uh, very cheap on Amazon. I think she said it was about $5 because they're mass produced. And she took it apart. And so what this means is that now she's got a devoted power source that she can turn on and off and recharge in this notebook that she herself has created. So we saw the beautiful art of her, her map and her illustrations, but we also see the beautiful art of the electronics and the, the copper tape traces that she's used to connect 
this battery, her power source, to her SparkCore uh, Wi-Fi chip, which then talks to the pages as she's hooked them up. And this here is sort of a blue sky, high level. This is what an advanced scientist with some, some time and imagination could do. And we find it very inspiring because here it's, again, showing us what happens when somebody's really authentically engaging with the topic. You are pulling in all these different disciplines. And it's not, again, just because she wants to see, as a CS person, if she could write a program that would ping the tides and then create some sort of display. It was about how could she make that larger data source meaningful in her own life based on a question that she herself was interested in. And so with that, I think I'll bring it back to the group for comments. Um, I know a number of you saw this, in, this beautiful notebook that she created in person uh, back in at DML. So handing it back to the group. Thanks, Jen. I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out. The uh, one thing that really strikes me is the possibilities for open data. A lot of us have been around citizen science projects and some of the uh, interfaces and the, pro and the connections that kids are able to make. I was thinking uh, to myself that we're kind of re uh, reverse engineering some of the app inventor activities um, and connecting online with offline and doing both those things. Uh, but the, the implications for open data projects with kids are really interesting. And while this is a high-end project, clearly, um, what we want to do in the, over time is figure out how this can become something that's translatable for the classroom. As you guys were saying, it's all about implementation. So I'm curious, any, any thoughts about that as we kind of turn towards implementation practices? This is kind of a vision. It's a little bit of a vision prototype we tried to get at so we could keep in mind the connected learning experience and what's feasible. So thoughts or reaction at all? I just wanted to say one quick comment. Um, it struck me as I was listening to Jen um, and thinking about this beautiful project, which I saw at DML as well, which really was striking. Both times around, it's striking. Um, that the, the whole engagement on some level is about pushing the learning capacity of journaling and notebooks and on some level that um, there's a kind of intimacy and personal quality to writing in a journal or writing in a notebook that's different than when you're on the screen and with the with the machine so to speak so if we could harness that sort of sensibility around the intimacy and the personal but then project it as you're saying to a kind of broader look at the world um, through innovation and what is meaningful to us, then it's the it's like the most powerful nexus of 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 those factors. You know, the 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 data, big data and, and sort of um, harnessing it in some way, but then also what is most um, intimate and immediate for a learner in a personal sense. That's what I love about the this um, work in general. So I thought I'd start off with that comment before we get into the details of implementation. Well, thanks, Mia. That's great. I mean, I think you captured exactly this. I'll share one other comment before I pass it back to you guys. When Natalie was teasing out how she would go about this, this initially started with Jen and Natalie talking about creating basically a signaling device where you might post a picture of your notebook online and this had got at the issue you're raising me, which is what do you choose to share and how do you choose to share it and what happens to that information as you develop it and curate it and then post it. And uh, you know, so much happens in real time and in and, and smaller bytes and all kinds of data is publicly available. What do you do when you choose to share and how would you go about it? And the first idea was simply to po take a picture, put it online and use this device and the Spark Core chip to provide notification. But as Natalie began to tease out what would be valuable, she came at exactly the point you're making. She thought, I'd actually rather have the internet come to me. Well, how could I pull something off the internet and have it situate in my notebook so on a regular basis it becomes relevant to me every time I open my notebook and I'm able to connect to the internet? What do I see that brings the world to me? Uh, and which, and then, then you kind of get the reverse. How do I then share it back? And so I think there's a dynamic and an engagement model that's implicit in the notebook that you're getting at, which is something that drew Jen and me to this as well. So I'll just offer that and then mute myself. Any other comments, folks? Um, it's interesting to me how quickly you've made the jump to becoming connected to others, or maybe that's just uh, your natural and Jen's natural thought process. But for me as a teacher, you know, writing for a long time was something that you did that was personal or that students did that was personal. 
And when the opportunity came around to uh, publish and share and be open with writing through, say, blogging and now microblogging, um, I was it was immediately attractive to me, and I, I jumped right aboard that. And so now, in this process of creating circuits, it's really uh, really exciting to see, you know, students that they are creating their circuits or or art, and already you have thought that one extra step ahead, which is how to uh, become connected with their this this writing or this artwork. Um, so that's very exciting. I, I, I'm thrilled that you took it to that level. Well, it's interesting stuff. It's fascinating. And again, I keep coming back to the reverse engineering of an app inventor or some of the tools kids can use when they get into hackathons and they're quickly using a lot of the GPS functionality and the data capture functionality in their devices. Um, you know, you can do a citizen science project with this thing pretty readily in an interesting way. You can also do it on your phone. And um, being creating those kinds of tangible experiences that let kids navigate those spaces and those experiences seems really powerful. Yeah. I, I was going to sort of jump in and just say that um, there's always just there's also just that qualitative difference because I was thinking the same thing is that you know that um, I was trying to think of like when I would have access to my notebook but not a another kind of a screen or something like that and that I was because I was thinking about like doing you know pulling pulling a class or pulling an audience or something like that and having them you know like text response or something and that and that you could have a sort of ready-made chart that lights up in the back that pulls the data as it comes in or something and that there's just a, a qualitative difference that is there's a tactility there's a, I don't know what it is but but it's something that seems like um, I don't know more engaging, more manageable in some way because it's a notebook as opposed to a device that has a gazillion things that I don't necessarily understand going on under its hood. Whereas I'm sort of in control of the things that are going on under the hood of this particular notebook. So yeah. Well, another thing that was really interesting to me about Natalie's comment, she said when I was building this, and you know she's a she's a high She's a high-level maker and CS person and artist in her own right. But she said all the materials I use were equal. Her scissors, her fabric, her string, her paper, her watercolors, her computer. I mean, she was she, that was what struck her. For a person who's very interdisciplinary and very facile with all of it, she was really taken with that. And I think that's a big piece of that puzzle, Peter, is that you know, it's all there and it's, it's right at your fingertips and you're mastering it as you go. Yeah. That, that was what I was going to say, too. There's a beauty to being able to pick up a pencil or a colored pencil and have it interact with um, with your circuits, with your connectivity, and you don't often have those interacting in that same way where they are on equal footing. And so there's that beauty of um, not um, privileging one or the other, other, but having them both in the same space. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was going to jump in quickly, David. Yeah, uh, I came out from behind the, the mask. The end of nice, the nice to see you, Paul. Yeah, good to see you all, too. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that uh, I think everything that has been said already um, also amazed me about this work. And I think, um, as well, to me, what's interesting about the way in which Natalie, um, and G, I, I would say, but in this project specifically, yeah. Natalie has been thinking about the work, is um, I, I think from a systems perspective, it's really fascinating that um, you know the notebooks and any kind of circuitry that we do, uh, you know, brings up these notions of how do we design um, for a system. Um, but in Natalie's case, I feel like she is she's taking this um, whole notion of what the systems are actually contained within the notebook, um, and uh, you know, and and, and uh, thought about multiple systems and the way in which they interact. So it's you know the system of the circuitry within the notebook. Um, it's the system. Uh, that is, you know, the web essentially, and how she connects to the web. Um, so I, I think the the degree to which this work also promotes uh, those ideas of systems thinking is really exciting. Um, yeah. At many levels. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. The systems thinking piece is a big part of this puzzle. Um, I'm going to shift the shift the conversation now, if that's okay, to go to a first round of implementation discussions. Um, Three of you on this call here, Kim, Lou, and Peter, I think, have been the recipients of a little circuit path.
back, a uh, collection of stickers. Um, Kim and Peter, I think this is the first time you've gotten stuff delivered to your door or taken it home. Lou, though, Lou has got some of G's contraband stickers back in Boston and played with it, and I think, Lou, it's, we also saw some Twitter posts where it looks like you may even have messed around with microcontrollers. Is that true? <laughs> we yeah. have. So, we have. All right. All right. So I'm um, looking at just doing a time check. Uh, maybe we could, Lou, maybe you could jump in and describe uh, quickly what you did with stickers, what you're doing with microcontrollers, what you anticipate doing next. And okay. we'll do a little round robin and go to Peter and Kim. We'll capture that, and then we'll switch gears and talk about what could happen next, thinking about the summer and beyond. Okay? Okay. All yours, Lou. So um, we made basic circuits in my class uh, with the uh, contraband uh, circuit stickers, and they worked uh, famously. Uh, the students took to them right away, and it was uh, a real highlight of the class so far. And then um, they wrote, uh, to, to, to get them involved in writing, I kind of had them write um, reflections and maybe uh, descriptions of their troubleshooting steps and their design process. And um, so then I wanted to kind of uh, kick it up a notch with, the, with these students who did so well with the circuits, ba making the basic, basic circuits. And um, the Jen introduced us to the mic adding microcontrollers to create a uh, blink pattern of of your choice. And what was nice for me is um, I'm teaching digital literacy, which involves a lot of coding, and so this added a language component to the creation of the of the um, circuits. And uh, so we did some vision. I, I showed them some materials and some examples, and then students. Uh, hello, you still there? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, then the students um, wrote some some plans for. Okay, it looks like we might have lost Lou temporarily. Yeah, looks that way. I think so. Uh, he just dropped out. Shall we switch gears while he co comes back? Yeah, yeah. why don't um, Let's Paul do or Kim, or not Paul or Kim. Peter. Uh, Peter. Peter or, if Kim, either of you want to. Yeah, Kim, do you want to jump in and think about, um, you've got some stickers. What are your sure. thoughts about yeah. <laughs> I um, I actually got back from Washington, D.C. and found the sticker packet sitting on my desk um, at school, which is great. Um, so now thinking about, I'm really thinking about my classroom as a place to explore where to go next with the circuitry. So I have these little guys, six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds, who um, we're going to figure out exactly what this could mean to hack a notebook and add circuitry to um, to some writing and drawing that they're going to be doing. So I don't have the whole unit planned out yet for them, but um, I know they'll be excited about it, and I know that it'll be an interesting process that will help me then work with teachers in our writing project and think about how we might use this in both um, our programming um, with um, young people in the summertime, but also um, I know teachers, they'll be just like Lou. They'll want to be taking it back to their own classrooms and thinking about what they might do with it there, too. So I think there's just endless possibilities. But I'm excited. I mean, the stickers are sitting on my desk, so this is, this is real. I was already in conversation with Jen trying to figure out, now, where do I get that copper tape? And then I just realized I have to find some batteries. So I've got some work to do, but I think it'll be fun. Yeah, nice. Peter, any thoughts? Um, sure. So... Um, I also have a nice envelope full of goodies, um, and I'm I'm teaching a class right now for future elementary teachers, um, and we're doing this. Um, we're do, it's called reading literature for future teachers, and we're currently working on uh, this sort of unit on poetry, and we're taking this approach of to, of um, hacking poetry, so using using poems as mentor texts and borrowing liberally from. Um, from poets' words and styles and themes and sort of making their, them our own. And um, the sort of culminating thing with this is they're going to, like, choose something that they've, some poem that they've 
um, hacked and made that they really liked for whatever reason. And as part of their sort of um, turning it from a project into a revised and ready for sort of like uh, publishing, um, is it'll they'll get they'll paper circuitify it somehow. Um, so we'll we'll play with the different um, different sort of potentials of uh, of illumination and um, and of like sort of the the different ways that like G has shown um, ways of like layering light and using things like that as a way. And we have this uh, this sort of public um, event at the uh, early in May. And so they will um, have the opportunity then to sort of share those um, as a, in a sort of display space and be there to talk to people as they come through and look at them. So nice. I'm excited about that. And then that will, I'm sure, go on to um, me being able to speak with more authority about the stuff to <laughs> the people in my site um, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, over the summer, and we'll, we'll continue um, playing and hacking and things like that. So nice. that's the idea. So I'll just put a plug in for documentation, and then I'll let Jen talk a little bit about what she set up in terms of an informal way to get some qualitative information out of what you guys are doing. Jen, you want to speak a little bit about that? Because between the G Plus and the a light Google form, uh, we're looking to capture some reflection about that. Sure. So as everyone just heard, we've got teachers teaching from kindergarten all through high school and adults. Um, currently practicing teachers, but we're also working with some pre-service teachers as well here in San Francisco. And so this work has a really wide range of possibilities, and we want to make sure that we're capturing what all these wonderful practitioners are doing as they're piloting these exercises. So we're trying to be really thorough about capturing information at different stages of the process. So we've got a pre-survey out there for the educators we're working with, because we're curious to find out about you know, their own comfort dealing with circuitry, science concepts in the classroom, curriculum integration, that sort of thing, um, and hear about what about the work is attractive and interesting and engaging for educators. Um, and we've also got some pre and post activity questionnaires and response forms for the youth because we want to know also from them like what was their prior understanding about what electricity is and how it works, what, what a circuit is, their own uh, proclivities regarding steam, STEM, science, making, things like that. Uh, because we want to know whether or not this is going to help interest more kids and adults in making and engineering using paper circuitry and electricity. And so that's sort of the official program documentation evaluation methodology that we're using. So we've got both qualitative and quantitative measures, but we've also got an informal space because it's important to have a professional learning community and as a former teacher I know that I always learn my best tricks from my colleagues, my currently practicing colleagues. So we've created this Google space. I put a link to it in the Hacking the Notebook chat um, on the Educator Innovator webinar so please feel free to join. It's for anyone who's interested. You don't have to participate. You can just lurk although we would love it if you added your own projects but we have spaces for you to post what projects you're currently working on, whether they're personal projects, whether they're class project. If you're having issues, you can take a picture of what you're working on and solicit the group for help. Um, you could show off the awesome things that you're doing. And we're really hoping that we can build this community of practice online to share what they, their students, or other collaborators are working on so that we all can learn from that. Thanks. Great. Um, let's switch up now and talk a little bit about the summer. And Jen, I'll ask you to do. A, a, we're going to. We were talking about the summer making connecting. And Paul, please feel free to show your face again as we segue to this. Um, maybe we could, Nia, just to come back to you to get you back in the conversation. Maybe we'd switch up and just get your thoughts immediately as a way to give us a prompt. What are some of your thinking, your thoughts about uh, implementation as you see the summer? I know you're running. A, you're putting a makers program together this summer. There's a variety of things you're probably involved in in terms of your writing project commitments and your ambitions. Could you talk a little bit about what you see, uh, how you see paper circuits might work in this way, and then we could use that to kind of reform or rethink how, or rethink, but go back at the question of the uh, summer of making and connecting and what the hack the notebook could mean in that context. So Mia, do you want to say a few things about what your thoughts are about going forward? Sure. Um, well, first of all, in, in the context of launching the makerspace, 
um, I thought to myself that the best way to really get some momentum going for the makerspace is ultimately to have events, events like punctuated moments wherein there is a kind of engagement that has an outreach element. Um, and so I have a particular moment in time that I wanted to designate as sort of hacking the notebook moment within the summer. But it's also framed um, within the context of the Connected Learning MOOC. Um, when we had our National Writing Project Spring Meeting just last week in DC, I was able to make, meet with some of the CL MOOC team and I discussed the fact that our writing project sites um, are really moving towards a connected learning and an open learning kind of embrace um, and more than ever writing project sites throughout the country are thinking about ways to really sort of um, bring teachers into the professional development fold around open learning context. So with that in mind, I kind of volunteered our writing project to be a bit of a guinea pig in the midst of the connected learning MOOC, wherein we might facilitate for one week. Um, and I, at the time, you know, just through the inspiration of conversation with colleagues, this is how all great ideas come, right? I said, why don't um, we, as the Kane University Writing Project, lead one um, cycle, you know, because the way the Connected Learning MOOC works is that it's um, a week, is each week is uh, a designated maker cycle. So why don't we try to, why don't we sort of step up as a writing project site and as a community to facilitate or support one week of making, and I suggested that our week be called Hack Your Writing Week. And you could conceive of that in a thousand different ways, right? I mean, it's all about digital tools and, and transformation of writing within the context of new media. So, but I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to have one day of that week be a paper circuitry day where we somehow do a webinar or sort of um, do some paper circuitry within the context of our writing project, so a local kind of experience, but also go live with it for inspiration within the context of the National Writing Project. So that's the sort of um, idea I have going right now. And I have to say that it's partly inspired by the Hour of Code initiative that occurred in early December, because mm -hmm. at our writing project, we um, hosted a campus code-in, which was intergenerational. So I had children who were elementary school aged, I had university students, I had administrators of the university who were just stopping by. There was, of course, a little food to get everyone sort of engaged and community oriented. And then we all had these laptops and we all um, played with the tutorials around the hour of code. So I imagine a similar kind of intergenerational moment around paper circuitry and I think if we kept it really simple not go I mean obviously Natalie's work is profoundly inspired but that's a sort of as you said Jen like a, a you know pie sky kind of aspiration but I'm imagining maybe we could create like a um, some kind of project like create your own gift card through like circuitry or something like that something that many people could you know enter into with some sensibility around then we could have a hack day for paper circuitry which was within the context of the maker cycle week around hack your writing. Right on. That's great. But I have to figure out how to hack, I have to figure out how to lead a paper circuitry group. But I have a feeling I can just um, call Kim and find out what happened <laughs> in the classroom and talk to Peter and I know I can do that. You know, I know I can rely on my colleagues to help me with the nuts and bolts part of it. I think that's true. And I mean, I think also this is going to raise a lot of opportunities to triangulate some of the activities that are happening across the network so that we could capture the, you know, make the most of those connections and what people know yeah. and what people are trying to do. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, you know, Jen, I was wondering if I could Paul, just jump in quickly. Yeah, um, jump in, Paul. Just a tiny little bit of context around the summer of making and connecting. So um, this, uh, this summer we're going to launch uh, the second iteration of the summer of making and connecting. And, um, as Mia mentioned, uh, one aspect, so when I say we, um, I would say that the National Writing Project, um, which is the, um, which is one of the core partners in Educator Innovator and the Educator Innovator effort, will be through that Educator Inno Innovator lens, um, uh, focusing on the launch of the Summer of Making and Connecting, which will really focus on this idea of, of educators making and learning through that process, um, all powered by 
these uh, set of principles known as connected learning. Um, so there'll be more on this, you know, coming soon. But like last summer, um, we'll have a big, um, massive open online collaboration um, called CL MOOC, and that's what uh, Mia was was referencing. And again, there'll be more information about this um, coming soon. And I would say for for all of these items. Um, definitely subscribe to the Educator Innovator blog, um, educatorinnovator.org, to learn more as it unfolds. Um, one last thing that I would say, another um, core partner in this summer of Making and Connecting is uh, the Mozilla Foundation, and they'll be um, facilitating maker parties um, throughout the world, actually. Um, so that will be happening um, primarily in a youth-facing kind of way, but uh, there'll be many, many events happening, and I would say as well, um, a whole number of educator innovator partners are are planning activities around the summer that we will highlight through the educator innovator blog. Uh, so that's the context, and really, I would just say stay tuned for more information. Well, thanks, Paul. I mean, and and um, that's great background, and I think Mia, the, the the description of what you're up to and how you might situate that, and the CL MOOC is a really powerful way to think about that. Um, Jen, do you have your notebook with you by any chance? Um, I do. Yeah, Jen and I were talking with Paul a little bit about how to present a kind of prompt for sort of an open access event-based campaign, let's call it, very much along the lines of what both Mia and Paul have talked about. And um, I'll let Jen describe this sort of prompt. We're teasing this out, trying to create something. I think on one end, Mia's point about hack a card is a simple and very accessible and doable, playful way to get started. Jeed uses that. Uh, a lot. You'll see it in a lot of the workshops that she's done and others like them. Um, we were thinking of a way to uh, explore maybe the, the notebook process generally. Um, we're going to share this with you guys. Jen, you want to talk a little bit about it? Sure. So uh, depending, of course, on the length of your engagement and who you're trying to reach, doing a simple thing like a card is a great idea. Uh, but for if you're looking to introduce paper circuitry with a group that you may be meeting with more often or if you're finding your youth or your learners are really excited about this work and want to keep doing it, you can introduce the idea of them hacking their own notebook. And it doesn't have to be as wonderful and amazing as G's hacked notebook is or as Natalie's is. Um, I hacked my own notebook here. This is the one I take with me everywhere and bring to meetings. Simply by adding a dedicated power source, this here is a 3 volt coin battery that I placed in a commercial holder that you can buy from any DIY hobbyist electronics store. So this I think I bought from adafruit.com and uh, it's used a lot in e-textiles, so people who want to add electricity and circuits to their soft sculpture or clothing or things like that. And then I created two leads uh, using conductive thread that I crocheted because I'm a bit of a fiber geek, right? So I like to knit and I like to crochet. So this was something that made sense to me and I took little jumper leads, took the alligator clip off, and then connected it to my conductive thread. So now basically what I have here is a dedicated way that I can power any circuit in my notebook. So you can see I've got tape and LEDs down here. Let's see if I can make this work. It's hard to see when I'm trying to do this through my webcam. Um, <laughs> I don't recommend the webcam. I highly demo. recommend being a bit more. There we go. Yeah. So That's you can it. see the lights come on there. Uh, but this is just one way to do that. And so this sort of gave us the idea of, you know, again, if you're inspired by the hacked notebook, but you're not feeling ready to try to wire up a rechargeable battery or a Bluetooth chip, really what do you need? It's a system, like Paul said, you need three things. You need a power source. And that could be a 3-volt battery. It could be AA batteries. It could be a 9-volt battery. You need some sort of uh, connective lead. So I use conductive thread, but you could also use a wire or copper tape. And then you need some sort of fastener. So I use the alligator clips, but maybe you could find highly conductive paper clips. I mean, it's sort of the limit is your imagination. If you wanted to get really geeky, like you, I could have crocheted beads into this and made it super pretty but still conductive. And the possibilities are pretty endless once you have an idea of what materials you can cho choose from to hack your own notebook. So this summer we're going to put out a challenge of hack your own notebook your way um, because my choices here were made from my notebook and based on what I had at hand. If I was doing it from scratch I might have chosen different materials. 
everyone's notebooks and the way that they have them would be as different and varied as the people doing it, which is why notebooks are so awesome and amazing tools for learning. So we're hoping that everyone watching us today and who watches this in the future, hopefully on archive, will join us this summer and help us document all the different ways you can hack your notebook. Yeah. So, you know, we're trying to, uh, we're trying to capture a, a, a springboard and a prompt that would let people jump into this in whatever way they need to or want to and whatever schedule is allowed. So, um, Kim and Peter, could you, and Lou, are you part of the uh, summer programming or are you just, uh, are you a TCU who's fishing a lot this summer? Oh, no, I'm around whenever I can, whenever yeah. Peter puts something together, I'll, I'll be there. Yeah, I'm, so I'm curious, you know, as, as, as you, you, many, many of you direct the programs, I'm curious as you think about your PLCs and your peer work, um, how, what the blend of youth programming and uh, teacher training or teacher support looks like and how this might play out this summer for you. Any, any thoughts about this? Because it's really the blend of teacher practice and student experience that we're trying, to, we're trying to get spread as best we can. And I'm curious what your thoughts are, if you have any at this point. Well, I'll, I'll speak up for that. I mean, I'm, listening to Mia really just um, inspired me when she talked about blending the CL MOOC experience with her summer institute. Because the thing that I know about work like this circuitry work is that we as teachers have to have some level of comfort with it in order to take it to our students and help them at least get started with it. And then I'm sure they'll, like they do with everything else, go take it in their own direction and do great and wonderful and unexpected things with it. But that, that first piece of bringing um, teachers together and having them explore some possibilities, like, I mean, even what Jen just showed with the dedicated power source, I can see teachers getting excited about that as well and doing some things that are different than the sort of um, templated work that we were first introduced um, to this project with. So I just I just think that there's endless possibilities, but it to me it, it starts with teachers playing with just like we ask them to play with their writing in our summer institutes, we want them to play with these circuits and the intersection of the circuitry and writing and art, and then figure out you know like what are what are the next steps for this? Which I think that I don't know that the CL MOOC piece seems like that playful intersection. Yeah. And Kim, just to pick up on this, with the programs you're directing this summer and you look at the Institute, do you imagine this to be like, a, as Mia's describing, like perhaps a day of hacking and making around a notebook idea as part of a sequence for your summer Institute? Or what's, the, what's the implementation frame you could imagine in San Diego? It's so interesting because I can imagine some different ones. But one of the things that we want to do is actually have what we would call an advanced Institute for our TCs, people like um, Lou, who come and put programs on for our um, for our um, summer institute? Sorry, my cat is distracting me as he's trying to eat my plant. Um, and the, by having this advanced institute where you bring together a group of TCs and have them play around with the circuitry and then think about so how, what does this look like in our summer programming? I think is the better question. Instead of asking me to figure it out, I would love to have them figure it out. And I'm sure we'll have great, great ideas. Great. Nice. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Peter, do you have any thoughts about it? Is it a, a similar sort of improvisation? Are there scenarios where either working with TCs and folks like Lou, or are there other sort of uh, groups that you see this might apply to this summer or beyond? Well, that, um, last summer we had a couple of maker days um, for our TCs and, and for any sort of friends or colleagues that they wanted to bring along. Um, and so we had a, a making with technology and a making with our hands um, different days. And um, this summer, uh, I've just tapped one of, our, um, one of our TCs who has been really good at, she's been a participant in the NaNoWriMo um, thing every November for a number of years. And she sort of does community organization of people who are writing and gets them to come to coffee shops and write together and do readings and stuff. And she's going to be sort of our local liaison for the CL MOOC. Um, and so she's going to get people from our site and other people just from our area who are participating in that together in a physical space so that um, it's a, you know, it's massively open and online, but also 
local and face to face um, in some ways. So, uh, so I think that um, you know if if uh, Mia's site leads uh, a paper circuit thing, then we will have some expertise and support in in Lou and in uh, in my experiences uh, to go and help them sort of push on this notion of the paper circuit and ways to sort of hack a notebook and and uh, uh, so I mean I see it in in those places um, we're also running advanced institutes and um, and a regular summer institute as well so you know the people that are at those always want to know stuff so I'm yeah. really I'm really optimistic that this could touch a whole lot of different programming um, so yeah I think that it'll be really great <clears throat> and so Dave, I, I want to pick it. Yeah, Paul. Go I'm sorry, ahead. I just want to jump in quickly and, and pick up on something that um, I think everyone has alluded to, and then Peter in particular has been talking about, which is uh, the opportunity I think this summer um, through this kind of work uh, to to connect with um, a larger educator community beyond you know your writing project site, or to connect with uh, community resources like say libraries and museums. Um, makerspace um, opportunities in your community that may exist already. Um, so I think I bring this up because I think the opportunity exists, and I think it's a it's you know a, just um, a wonderful uh, possibility in terms of being able to broaden reach. But um, but also because I, I want to make sure that our audience understands that regardless of whether you're uh, a writing project teacher or not, um, this is work that you can intersect with. And that the work um, under the Summer of Making and Connecting umbrella uh, really is beyond um, uh, local writing project site work. Um, as important and as critical as that is, you know, as a writing project person, I, I truly believe in that work. But that we um, see the, the Summer of Making and Connecting as you know a big tent event essentially. So to the extent that I didn't make that clear, I, I just want to, to make sure that everyone understands that, you know, regardless of whether you're uh, an NWP teacher or not. You can make and you can right. connect this summer under our umbrella, and furthermore, it seems like uh, what a nice opportunity to connect with you know local uh, learning institutions um, and with the community around this kind of work this summer. Yeah, and Paul, I'll just pick up on that and talk. We'll talk a little bit about logistics because um, um, as G has talked about, and she's done a great. She's been very generous as as her partner um, Andrew Bunny Huang in terms of make, trying to make the materials available. And these things are coming off the uh, crowd supply, uh, crowd crowdfunding campaign that they started uh, back in November. So there's going to be a certain amount of inventory available on sort of just regular uh, websites like Makershed and Crowd Supply, so you can simply download and purchase it, um, and you can get it through those channels. I'm curious, just as a kind of straw poll uh, with the folks online here, what kind of numbers are you thinking? Uh, and just go back, uh, Mia, maybe we could pick up with you. I know that. With the CL MOOC, we're talking about people all over the world potentially signing up to do as just as Paul described, which mm -hmm. is to participate in the program, do the summer of making connecting. Um, so we can't predict that, obviously. But if we're we're trying to just get a sense of those of us who will be involved and ideally directly working in facilitation in some capacity, mm -hmm. getting a kind of finger in the in the wind in terms of what's what kind of numbers do you think this could. How many, how many participants could it be, Mia, would you imagine, just locally, back where you are, before we even start to think about the folks who would be opting in to the CL MOOC? Well, just in terms of the local representation, we have both an ISI, Invitational Summer Institute, going on, and an advanced ISI, um, where we have um, more seasoned TCs coming back for um, further professional development. So I imagine that both of those um, both of those communities would be sort of folded in. And in terms of numbers, um, the ISI right now already has uh, 15 participants. Um, so I would imagine around 15 from the regular ISI. And then if, um, with the advanced ISI, I'm hoping for around six to eight to participate in that. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm thinking approximately 20 to 25 teachers who will be involved. And then I'd like to open it up to children as well, stu young students. Um, and um, there's a few ways that I can tap through my outreach efforts. There's a few sort of communities I could tap into to pull um, some of the students that will be around in the summertime into this. There's actually a, a sort of summer camp that the writing project actually isn't running, but a colleague of mine is doing a kind of um, summer 
uh, sort of an innovator summer camp on campus. So there's a small group of students who will be a part of that. And quite frankly, I always throw in my own kids. They're really always guinea pigs. <laughs> so I would think like maybe I could get like 10, around 10 to 15 current students from the ages of around 7 through the, around 14 um, along with that group of teachers. That's what I imagine in the best case scenario. That's helpful. And uh, Kim and Peter, does that sort of ballpark sound right in terms of um, a blend? It's just how it's just a helpful kind of straw poll to get a feel for volume uh, and how to how to secure it, make sure that folks have what they need. I feel like I'm almost worked from the other end out. Where I mean, I'm imagining um, if we there's a particular one of our young writers programs called Writing for Change that we're thinking about the idea of doing um, this kind of circuitry in. And we're anticipating that could be 50 kids. And yeah. so for me, I'm thinking like the other way around. What kind of supplies will we have will determine what kind of spaces that we'll do this work in. So we, we could do it with a lot more people, but if we are limited in supplies, then we'll have to you know, rethink and okay. figure out how to make that work. Yeah, it can go on both ends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Peter, um, does that, uh, sort of these two scenarios address anything that could happen with you? Yeah, I mean, I think that actually Mia's numbers are pretty much in line with what I would expect um, for our summer institute and our advanced institute. Um, mm -hmm. And for the um, people who are going to participate in the CL MOOC, um, you know, maybe another 10 or 15 or something like that. So maybe 40 people. Um, and yeah, I mean, I have some budgets that are going to expire before the end of June, so I'll probably be doing a little purchasing before then um, <laughs> to, to supply up for that. But yeah, that's helpful. Hey, David. Yeah, yeah, Lou. Uh, you know, my experience. I was I was really fortunate to get a batch of uh, circuit stickers to take to my classroom and put in the hands of students. Yeah. And so, I think maybe it's um, would be useful to think that if you have a, a teacher consultant or a teacher teaching a teacher, that they would have supply to give that teacher to take to their classroom and put in the hands of their students. Because right. doing it is one thing, and then putting these materials in the hands of students and watch what they do with it is, is quite another. Yes. Yeah, that's the goal. And yeah. um, there's a real power in the train a trainer and the PLCs that you guys are involved in. But the real goal is to deal with it in a bottoms-up way. Kim's point is that you could go wide and see what happens coming up. and uh, we could work the way down. Um, by way of wrap up, Luke, as you cut off briefly, just yeah. before, just uh, just if you could speak briefly to your experience with microcontrollers, and then we'll mm -hmm. wrap up. Because um, for folks who are listening in, Lou's I think unique among this group as having gone to a little workshop with us with Paul. He worked with microcontrollers. He took them into his classroom. He addressed programming issues. Do you want to just speak briefly on that? A couple yeah. minutes, then we'll wrap up. I think that's. Oh, well, I'm glad. I'm glad to have the chance. I'm sorry, I got cut yeah. off. Yeah. No, no. Go uh, ahead. Then we'll close it out. So yeah, I was really excited when we met um, in Berkeley and then saw the microcontroller and what that added to the to the project in regard to uh, um, adding code and more interaction with the circuits. Uh, I, I I thought it was even more appropriate for my class. And so then I uh, have been thinking, how am I going to implement this? And I've been reading a lot and I've been trying to introduce the ideas to this to the students and. Um, I was having a difficult time explaining and really even understanding myself how things worked and whatnot. Um, so then I just decided to get some materials in my hands and try to, again, put them in the hands of students. And I got uh, bought a, uh, thanks to the Northern California Writing Project, was, or, yeah, I was able to uh, buy a bunch of microcontrollers, um, AT Tiny's and AT Tiny uh, programmer. And then uh, still, I, would, I showed them to the students and it seemed exciting. And then Peter put, a big roll of copper tape and several batteries in my hands and I had no more excuses thanks to the uh, paper circuit uh, package that came in the mail and um, everything changed once I put the materials to build the project with uh, my students which was today and uh, I was trying to explain an abstract idea to them and was having a very difficult time getting them excited or what they could do and then I put the materials in their hands I just put a diagram a wiring diagram up on the board and they took to it so quickly, and they took the code. I, I emailed them the basic blink code, and they uh, made their own patterns and gave it back to me, and I ran it through the programmer, and they uh, 
they put it on here. I can show you, you know, they were building, you know, you recognize something like this. Um, you know, I got a bunch of them. They were so successful today, um, and they all were able to make their blink patterns, and then they came back asking me questions like, well, can I make this blink in time to music? And I then, obviously, the next step is like, okay, how can we could add sensors to this, and all of a sudden I'm learning about... Uh, uh, you know, uh, pulse modulation and and um, there's there's just opening the this floodgates to what they the projects that they want to build now. Um, so it's it's uh, just adding adding that small piece um, really adds a lot to the project. And then again, another iteration thinking wirelessly. My my mind's again kind of blown. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Lou. Thanks for giving that picture of it. It's so encouraging to see things working in the classroom and, and to see. If I knew how to put a video on this thing, I would show you a video of one of their blinks. But I, the first one that came, you know, the first one that rolled in, and it was just like, bingo, mine works. And then all of a sudden, all around the room, mine works too, mine works too, mine works too. And they all had different patterns. And then they wanted to reprogram the pattern because it didn't look like they expected it to look. And they wanted to make it go faster or slow down or. And it, yeah, it was tremendous. Hey. Well, you know, Lou, you can put those videos on the Google Plus community. I will do. And, and share that. And um, again, it, we're being reminded here that while the functionality is awesome and the science is awesome, it's also helping drive the ideas of how these could be used and why we're using it. Where again, it's not about just the tech, it's about what does the tech help us say, or help us think, or help us realize, or help us tie together? Yeah. yeah. Hey guys, I see it's five o'clock, so I think I'll wrap it up. And so we are out of time, and I want to take this last minute just to thank you all. It's been great to have you on online, you guys, and to thank everyone else who's watching or listening in on the chat. And if you'd like to stay abreast of the future opportunities and the resources with Educator and Innovator and our partners, uh, please sign up for EducatorInnovator.org. Uh, Paul tells me this will be soon be archived, and people can check it out at another time. But um, thanks to all of you guys for sharing your thinking, um, some of your practice, some of the successes you've had, and the thoughts you've got. We're really excited to figure out how to make this go this summer and have it happen with some spread and some really particular expressions of what's possible. And so watch for more information. It's been really, really helpful. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Okie doke. Bye -bye. We'll see you again. All right, thank you.